Blessed is he that read it, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein. For the time is at hand. Welcome to Word on the Screen, where we bring you hot topics. Today's study is going to be about the controversial man himself. Now, I made like three YouTube videos that was taken down. It's regarding the words and the life of Mr. Adolf. All right. Now, um, Kanye is under a lot of heat because he said that he liked Mr. Adolf. Now, I'm not going to give my opinion on this video regarding you know my my feelings about mr adolf but today's studies is going to be regarding his speech all right now mr adolf made a speech um at berlin sports palace and on january 30th 1941 and i would like to share that and as we go through this um i'm gonna break it down i'm gonna stop um periodically and um give my take so i need you guys to pay attention because you're going to get a lot of information regarding the the man that every the legend of mr adolf because as black people in america in 1941 we were subject um subjected you know we was oppressed and um we didn't have time to um get into the politics of the european nations because we had our own fight and struggle at that time. All right. So Mr. Ye does have the right to his opinion. Like we all do. So we're going to go through um, um, Mr. Adolf's um, speech from this, this time. And we're going to discern for ourselves. Do we agree or disagree? Now, the people who, who taught us that um, Mr. Adolf was a bad man. Chandler Adolf was a bad man was the same people who enslaved our foreparents so as a nation of people we should not believe anything they tell us until we do the research and I think that's fair why would we believe the same people who enslaved us when they tell us something now keep in mind that we have an interest in this too because the same people that was fighting against our enemies <laughs> you know you know like it's a sign you know the the enemy of 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 the enemy of your enemy could be your ally so let's find out and make our own um discernment you know regarding um mr chandler adolf so i'm gonna go ahead and start and i'll be back with commentary per periodically through this because it's, it's, qu it's quite long so we're gonna break it down and be very attentive today okay this speech was written by Chancellor Adolf Hit I'm not gonna say his last name I don't wanna get flagged and it was translated by Richard H. Emmerman Professor Richard H. Emmerman and the date was January 30th, 1941. Now, this is the words of Mr. Adolf, Chancellor um, Adolf, from his own mouth. So let's hear from the horse's mouth, and I'm gonna break this down as we go. So I'm gonna stop the video every time I see some key points, and I'm gonna, um, you know, expound on it from my my take. I'll be back. Chancellor Adolf Hitler, at Berlin Sports Palace. January 30, 1941. My German country, men, men and women, long pause, changes of government have occurred frequently in history, and in the history of our people. It is certain, however, that never was a change of government attended with such far-reaching results as that eight years ago. At that time the situation of the Reich was desperate. We were called upon to take over the leadership of the nation at a moment when it did not seem to develop towards a great rise. We were given power in circumstances of the greatest conceivable pressure, the pressure of the knowledge that, by itself, everything was lost, and that, in the eyes of the noblest minds, this represented a last attempt, while in the eyes of evil wishers it should condemn the National Socialist movement to final failure. 
Unless the German nation could be saved, by a miracle, the situation was bound to end in disaster. For during a period of 15 years, events had moved downwards without respite. On the other hand, this situation was only the result of the world war, of the outcome of the world war, of our own internal, political, moral, and military collapse. For these reasons, it is particularly important on a day like this to think back to the course of that entire national misfortune. What, what was the cause of the world war? I do not want to explain it from the personal aspect, about which so many treatises have been written. Ordered by the present President Roosevelt, American scholars have investigated the cause of the World War and made sure that there could be no German guilt. In moments of so great importance in contemporary history, individuals can play a significant part only if they enter the scene as really outstanding personalities. This was not then the case. Neither on the German nor on the other side were their personalities cast in an unusual mold. The cause, therefore, could not be due to the failure or to the will of individuals. The reasons went deeper. The German form of government, certainly, could not have been the cause of that war, for Germany was a democracy already and what a democracy. Strictly copied from the Western countries, it was compromised between monarchy and parliamentary leadership. On account of its form of government then, this state could certainly not be the cause of the war waged by the democracies against the Reich as it was then. Germany, considered as a political factor in the world, was much more of a cause, for after centuries of disruption and ensuing weakness, the German tribes and states had at last combined into a new state which naturally introduced a new element into the so-called balance of power, an element which was regarded as an alien body by others. Even more potent, perhaps was dislike of the Reich as an economic factor. After Germany had tried for centuries to remedy her economic distress by letting people gradually starve or forcing them to emigrate, the increasing consolidation of the political power of the Reich gave rise to a development of economic power. Germany began to export commodities rather than men, thereby securing the necessary markets in the world, a process, natural and just from our point of view, but others regarded it as encroachment into their most sacred domains. Here we come to the state which regarded this encroachment as intolerable England. 300 years earlier England had gradually built her empire, not perhaps through the free will or the unanimous demonstrations of those affected, but for 300 years this world empire was welded together solely by force. War followed war. One nation after another was robbed of its freedom one state after another was shattered so that the structure which calls itself the British Empire might arise. Democracy was nothing but a mask covering subjugation and the oppression of nations and individuals. This state cannot allow its members to vote if today, after they have been worked upon for centuries, they should freely choose to be members of this commonwealth. On the contrary, Egyptian nationalists, Indian nationalists in their thousands are filling the prisons. Concentration camps were not invented in Germany, it is the English who were the ingenious inventors of this idea. By these means they contrived to break the backbone of other nations, to remove their resistance, to wear them down, and make them prepared at last to submit to this British yoke of democracy. Alright, this is going to be my first take. Um, I do want to go over this part we just went over. And to me, I got a lot of out of this. It says, 300 years earlier, England had gradually built her empire. So, she gradually built her empire. Not perhaps through the, the free will or through the unanimous um, demonstrations of those affected. But for 300 years, this empire was welded together solely by force. War followed war. One nation after another was robbed of its freedom. Freedom, one state after another was shattered so that the structure which called itself the British Empire might arise. Democracy was nothing but a mass covering sub sub subjugation and the oppression of nations and individuals. Did you get that? Did you get that? It says democracy was nothing but a mask covering subjugation and the oppression of nations and individuals. This state cannot allow its members to vote if today. 
after they ha have been worked upon for centuries they should freely choose to be members of this commonwealth on the contrary egyptian nationalists indian nationalists and their in their thousands are filing on filling the prisons concentration camps were not invented by germany now this is not my words this is the words of chancellor adolf all right it is the english who were ingenious the ingenious inventor of the idea so let's read that again concentration camps were not invented by the germ by in germany it is the english who were the ingenious inventor of this idea by these means they contrived to break the backbone backbone of our nations to remove their resistance to wear them down and make them prepare at last to submit to this british yoke of democracy so british yoke british shackles british slavery of democracy so democracy is synonymous with what yoke which is slavery and oppression all right so let's continue and i'll be back with more commentary we have a lot of things to discuss in this because I, I actually went over this before i made the video so we're gonna break it down and i'm gonna give my take as we go democracy in this process a formidable weapon was that of lying that is of propaganda a proverb says that if the englishman speaks of god he means cotton and so it is today considering how pious and religious are the outward gestures of men who deliberately and with a cold heart drive nation after nation into a struggle serving only their material interests one is compelled to state that rarely has human hypocrisy reached such a pitch as that of the english today at any rate, at the end of the bloodstained path of British history over three centuries stands the fact that 46 million Englishmen in the mother country are ruling about a quarter of the globe. All right, so I do have to break down this paragraph right here because I got a lot out of this and, it's, and it, it entails a lot. So let's, let's see what it says. It says, in this process, a formidable weapon was that of lying. All right, so they use the weapon of lying that is of propaganda. So propaganda is what? Lying, all right? A proverb says that an Englishman speak, if an if a Englishman speak of God, he means cotton. Let's read that again. A proverb says that if an Englishman speak of God, he means cotton. And we already know who picked the cotton for this world. All right, so the Englishman Let's continue. And so it is today considered how pi pious a religion, a, 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 let's consider how pious and religious are the outward gestures of men who deliberately and with a cold heart drive nation after nation into a struggle serving only their material interests. One is compelled to state that really as human hypocrisy reaches such a pit as that of the English today at any rate at the end of the blood stained path of the British history over three centuries stand, stands the fact that 46 million Englishmen in the mother country are ruling about a quarter of the globe now this was way back in 1930 so they are ruling way more than a quarter of the globe and he's exposing it so i'm going to continue and we're going to break this thing down man all right let's go globe this means that there are 46 million men for about 40 million square kilometers it is important, my countrymen, to shout this to the world again and again, for they are brazen democratic liars who assert that the so-called authoritarian states are out to conquer the world, while in fact, 
the conquerors of the world are our old enemies. The British world empire has left behind an icy stream of blood and tears in the path of its creation. It rules today, undoubtedly, a tremendous section of the globe. But this world government is affected not by the power of an idea, but essentially by force, and where force does not suffice, by the power of capitalist or economic interests. Bearing in mind the history of the British Empire, we can understand the process itself only as a result of the complete absence of the European continent as an entity in face of this development, particularly by the absence of the German Reich. For 300 years, Germany was practically non-existent. While the British talked of God without losing sight of their economic interests, the German nation, overstrained to the limit, raised religious problems to such importance that bloody wars, lasting for centuries, ensued. This was one of the conditions which made the formation of the British Empire possible, for in the same measure with which the German nation spent its strength internally, it was eliminated as a power internationally, and in the same measure England could, undisturbed, build her empire through robbery. Not only was Germany practically eliminated from competition on this globe during those three centuries, the same holds for Italy, where there were similar phenomena as in Germany, but of a political and dynastic rather than a religious nature. For other reasons again, another great nation in East Asia was eliminated, which also for nearly four centuries had gradually withdrawn from the rest of the world, and ceasing to regard its own living space as vital plunged into voluntary solitude. In this way a system arose, particularly in Europe, which England called the balance of power, which means, in fact, disorganization of the European continent in favor of the British Isles. For this reason it was for centuries the aim of British policy to maintain this disorganization, not under the name of disorganization of course, but with a better sounding name. Just as they do not speak of cotton, but say God, they do not speak of the disorganization of Europe but of the balance of power. And this so-called balance of power, that is the real internal importance of Europe, enabled England again and again to play one state against another, so keeping the forces of Europe involved in internal struggle. Thus England could thrust forward undisturbed into other areas offering comparatively little resistance. Oh wow. <laughs> Let's go over this paragraph, man. This is crazy. In this way, a system arose, particularly in Europe which England called the balance of power, which means, in fact, this organization. <laughs> so everything they say is contrary. So they call it the balance of power, which means, in fact, this organization of the European continent in favor of the British Isle. So that's what they call balance of power. All right. Wow. For this reason, it was for centuries the aim of British, British policy to maintain this disorganization, not under the name of this organization, of course. So they don't use the name disorganization, but with a better sounding name, just as they do not speak of cotton, but say God. So when the white man's um, on his dollar in America says, in God we trust, it's at me in cotton we trust. Did you get that, guys? Now, this is the words of um, Chandler, Mr. Adolf, who I grew to really um, enjoy reading his um, content, his, his words, because this guy was like no other. Let's continue. They, did, they do not speak of this organization in Europe, but of balance of power. So that's those are the cold words they use. All right, and this so-called balance of power that is the real eternal importance of Europe. Wow. So that's the real eternal importance of Europe, which is um, this organization. All right. Wow. Enables England again and again to play one state against another. Wow, the same thing that's happening today. So keeping the force of Europe involved in an internal struggle, thus English could um, thrust forward undistributed into other areas offering comparative, comparatively, comparatively little resistance. So let's continue. 
and I'll be back with another breakdown. Um, there's a lot of stuff to digest here, so we have to be patient and um, pay attention. Resistance. And yet to speak today of England's world power or of England as the master of the world is nothing but an illusion. To begin with her internal situation, England, in spite of her world conquests, is perhaps socially the most backward state in Europe. Socially backward that is, a state orientated entirely in the interests of a comparatively small and thin upper stratum and the Jewish clique with which it is allied. The interests of the broad masses are of no weight in determining the orientation of this state. Here again propaganda phrases must serve. One speaks about freedom, one speaks about democracy, one speaks about the achievements of a liberal system meaning nothing but the stabilization of the regime of a section of society, which, thanks to its capital, is able to get hold of the press, to organize and direct it, and to create public opinion. Thus, in a state commanding the riches of the world, having gigantic living space at its disposal, in a state with altogether hardly one inhabitant per square kilometer, in a state so blessed by nature, millions are excluded from these benefits and live in greater poverty than the population of any of the overpopulated Central European states. I got to chime in right here. Wow. All right, so... <laughs> All right, so we're gonna start right here. We're gonna break this um, paragraph down to what we just thought that it says, and yet to speak today of England world power or, or of England as a master of the world is nothing but an illustration. So it's an illusion. And being with her eternal situation, England in spite of her world conquest is perhaps socially the most awkward state in Europe meaning country okay socially backward that is the state um um orientates entirely in the interest of comparative comparatively small and thin upper stratum all right check this out and the jewish clique meaning gang which <laughs> with which it is allied so england is in a clique which is a gang with his ally the you wish man all right you wish you wish y o u wish w i s h you wish all right let's continue the interests of the broad masses are of no weight in determining the orientation of the state here again propaganda which is lies. Remember we read that? Propaganda means lies. Here again, lies, phrases must serve. One speak about freedom. One speak about democracy. One speak about the achievements of the liberal system, meaning nothing but the stabilization of the regime of a section of society. Let's read that again. One speak of freedom, one speak of democracy, one speak about the achievement the achievement of a liberal system means nothing but the stabilization of the regime of a section of society. So a small percentage of people, which thanks to its capital, all right, that's the elites, is able to get hold of the press, which is the, the media to organize and direct it all right to puppet stephen a smith and all these shack all right and to create public opinions on Kyrie, kanye etc thus in the state com thus in a state commanding the riches of the world having gigantic living spaces at its disposal meaning colonization in a state with altogether hardly one inhabitant per square kilometer all right so they take up all this land and only use it all right in in a state so blessed by nature millions are excluded from her benefits all right read that again in a state so blessed by nature millions are excluded black americans 
Jamaicans, Haitian, black people from her benefits and live in greater poverty than the population of of any of her overpopulated central European states. Wow. Let's read that again. In a state so blessed by nature, millions are excluded from her benefits and live in in a greater poverty than the population of any of the overpopulated European states. Check this out. Let's continue. And I'll be back to chime in. States. The country which is a paradise for a few is nothing but continuous misery for many, that is, for the masses. Misery in nourishment, misery in clothing, misery particularly in housing, misery in security of income, and in the entire social legislation. And if all of a sudden a British Labour Secretary, who, incidentally, as a member of the opposition, is paid by the state, appears and says, after this war, after victory, England will have to tackle social problems, we will have to care for the wide masses, I can only reply, we have done this long ago. All right, so let me break down this portion right here. Look at, check this out. This is deep, man. This is America, what we're reading about also. All right. The country which is a paradise for a few, which is America, Europe, all right, is nothing but continuous misery for many, including myself and my people. All right. That is for the masses. Misery is nourishment in misery in nourishment so they nourish you in misery misery in clothing all right misery particularly in housing all right the housing market people can barely pay for an apartment all right people cannot barely live and eat and, and put um clothes on their back misery and security of income all right you got to work two jobs just to pay your rent and in the in entire social legislation and if all of a sudden and if all of a sudden a british labor secretary who incidentally as a member of the opposition is paid by the state appears and says after the war so they, they this is how they run game after the war after victory England will have to tackle social problems. We will have to take care of the wide masses. See, that's what Joe Biden tell us. I can, I can only reply, we have done this long time ago. Wow, that's raw. All right, let's continue and I'll be back with more commentary. A go. It is only interesting to us as a confirmation of our thesis that England in reality is socially the most backward country in the world. Thus, considered internally, this gigantic external wealth is really barren as far as the masses as distinct from the few are concerned. But even externally this world domination is only a figment. New centers have been given to the world. Gigantic states have arisen which can be neither attacked nor even threatened by Great Britain. The whole British idea of world domination was based on getting others to proceed against the continent. But outside this European continent or far beyond it great states have come into existence which are completely unassailable by England. British diplomacy may only attempt to maintain its position there by clever manipulations and by trying to bring other forces into play, which means that it must now attempt to raise the so-called balance of power in Europe to a balance of power in the world. In other words, it has to play great powers against each other in order to maintain at least a semblance of a world power. In Europe itself, however, the awakening of the nations has already done away with the theory of the so-called balance of power, that is, disorganization of the continent. The national development of Germany and the creation of the new German Empire pierced into this disorganized European continent and to the south of us, Italy did the same. To this must be added new elements which make the balance of power appear an illusion. It exists no longer. Therein we really see the real reason for the world war. 
Since 1871, when German tribes began to organize themselves and, under the leadership of a statesman of genius, formed an empire once more, and the national rebirth of the German nation found expression in a united state, Great Britain has been persecuting this new apparition. In 1871, even in 1870, immediately after the Battle of Sedan, British newspapers began to point out that this new structure was more dangerous to Great Britain than France had been. It had been hoped even then that Prussia might succeed, perhaps, by a long war, in throwing back France, but there was no wish that, from Prussia's rise there should emerge a national German rebirth or, even more, a new German empire. Thus began the period from 1871 to 1914, in which Great Britain continually plotted for a war against Germany, in which she was hostile and aggressive to Germany at every opportunity, until finally the world war broke out, the work of quite a small group of international and scrupulous rogues. And Great Britain received foreign help for this world war, which, again, she was only able to wage with foreign help. It is interesting to visualize the development of the British policy of world domination during the last 400 years. First, there was Spain, with Dutch help, then the fight against the Dutch, with the help of other European states, France amongst them, then, finally, was against France, with the help of Europe and that part of the world at Great Britain's disposal. The World War which shook Europe from 1914 to 1918 was exclusively the long-for result of British statesmanship. Although the whole world had at that time been mobilized against Germany, Germany was actually not defeated. We may safely state this today. I should not like to be a critic of the past if I had not improved upon it. But today, as one of the historic men who have improved matters, I may critically examine and judge the past, and all I can say is that the result of the year 1918 is merely the consequence of a rare accumulation of personal inefficiency in the leadership of our nation, a unique accumulation which had never existed before in history, nor let me tell these gentlemen will it ever be repeated. In spite of all this, this country and the German soldier for four years withstood the attack of a hostile world, and the German nation still believed in the honor of the remaining democratic world and its statesmen. This credulity of the German nation, which was at the time regretted by many, received a terrible reward. If today Englishmen come along and believe that it is only necessary to put on the gramophone the old propaganda records of the years 1917 to 18 in order to achieve a new result, I can only say they have not forgotten anything, but unfortunately for them, they have not learned by experience. In this respect, they differ from the German people. The German nation has learned since then, nor has it forgotten anything. We do not wish to be mean. Many times there have been broken pledges in the past. But what happened in the years following 1918 was not one broken pledge, broken pledges were mass-produced. Not a single pledge has been fulfilled. Never before has a great nation been deceived as the German nation was then deceived. It had received so many assurances, this credulous nation had been promised so much, and what did they do to our nation? It was plundered, it was exploited. A foreign statesman, an American, was employed to make the German people even more credulous. Perhaps this was really the reason why the German people were duped by this maneuver. But in this respect, too, they are immune against any similar attempts. The German people had opportunities, year after year, to ponder the sincerity of democratic promises and assurances and the honesty of democratic statesmen, to make comparison and to test them against their own experiences. It was in this period that the National Socialist Movement originated. If they now say, but why did they pounce on a new ideology, my answer is, because the old one failed miserably. Not only in the interior heavens. Democracy was a pitiful thing with us. When 40 or 50 odd parties compete with their gigantic philosophical interests, ranging from that of property down to the level of cyclists clubs, estate owners and so on, that in itself is a very bad sight, but quite apart from that, if we only had been rewarded externally for this miserable internal democratic distortion of our lives, we could at least say, well that stuff has certainly failed at home, but at least you received decent treatment outside. At home the whole thing was, of course, nothing but a joke, but foreign countries took you seriously or at least they pretended that they wanted to take you seriously. If they had kept some of their promises because you were willing to be good Democrats on the pattern of others. Oh, if at least this had been the case. But who was it they blackmailed? Who was it they sweated? Was it the National Socialist State? 
It was the German democracy. When I came home in 1918 and lived through the winter of 1918 and 1919, I realized, like many other people, that we could not expect regeneration from the existing political world in Germany, and so I began to search as did so many others and this was how that conception originated which later conquered the German nation as National Socialism. I started from the one insight, the German nation fell because it indulged in the luxury of spending its strength at home. This use of strength in the interior took away external strength according to an external law. The German nation had hoped to gain, in turn, the goodwill of others but it met only the naked egotism of the cruelest and meanest vested interests, which began to loot everything there was to loot. One should not have expected anything else. But now the die was cast. One thing seemed obvious to me, any rise could not originate from outside. First, the German nation had to learn to understand its own political struggle, which enabled it to rally Germany's entire strength above all its idealistic strength. And this idealistic strength was at the time only to be found in two camps, in the socialist and in the nationalist camps. But these were the camps between which there was the most mortal feud and strife. These two camps had to be fused into a new unit. Today, Hey, my countrymen, when millions and millions are marching under the symbol of this unity, this appears to be obvious. But in the years 1918 and 1909, this seemed to be the product of a diseased imagination. At best, people pitied me. Perhaps, my countrymen, it was lucky that it was so. If people had taken me seriously at that time, they would probably have destroyed me, and the movement at that time was much too small to be able to survive such a destruction. But it was perhaps destiny willed by nature or by God, that they laughed at us, mocked us, and that a certain type of propaganda only ridiculed us and regarded us as a joke. Thus we succeeded, gradually, in forming the first germ, and the first nucleus of a new national community an almost incredible historical phenomenon started by unknown people and willing followers among the masses of the people itself. There is only one other state in which this process may be regarded as having come to a successful conclusion, Italy, nowhere else in Europe. In many states we see, perhaps, a beginning and in all the democracies they fully realize the importance of such a process, and believe that they can achieve similar results by swindle. They forget one thing, such a rebirth of a nation is really a miraculous event, an event which presupposes faith rather than so-called abstract and super-clever knowledge. The fact that in the years 1918 to 1921 the simple belief of the broad masses slowly came to us, was the beginning of our movement. That made the little man from the factories and the mines, from the farms, from the offices, believe in his future, in the future of this idea and this movement, and in the victory which was yet to come. At that time our point of view was that if the German nation were not to repair its prestige in the world, that is to say, did not again become a powerful factor, Germany would shortly have 20 million people less. This was a matter of simple deduction. Year after year unemployment increased and caused the confusion of national conceptions and of economic plans. The constant change of governments prevented any wider vision. Projects could not even be made for two or three months ahead, because one could be sure that in three months the government would have changed. One would say dash why should I clear up the mistakes made by others? Another would say, why should I make improvements only for someone else to benefit? There was no longer any reason to attempt any efficacious and real solution. But this state of affairs naturally increased national weakness and the economic decline and caused more unemployment. The burden became greater, the capacity to carry it less, and the end had to be a collapse, the result of which could not be foreseen. Wow. I'm going to go over this paragraph right here. And this is like, as, as a, all right, before segregation, segre, um, you know, doing um, segregation, you know, we live among ourselves as black people in America. But when, when they removed that banner and um, allowed us to integrate, a lot of things changed. So let's read this and see how that compares. It said, year after year, unemployment increased and caused the confusion of national conception and of economic plans. The constant changes, the constant change of governments prevented a wider vision. All right. So it's like during the 60s when Martin Luther King, you know, I'm making a parallel. 
pro all right projects could not even be made for two or three months ahead because one could be one could be sure that in three months the government would have changed one would say why should i clear up the mistakes made by others and that's how our community look at things another would say why should i improve make improvements only for someone else to benefit so that sound like us there was a, no longer any reason to attempt any effectual and fallacious and fast slakia and real solutions but this state of affairs naturally increased um nation, national weakness and the economic decline and caused more unemployment the burden became greater the the capacity to carry it less and the end and the end had to be a collapse the result which of which could not be foreseen all right let's continue foreseen it was well to be believed that the kind and humane prophecy of the great democrat clemenceau that we had 20 million people too many would become the truth thus the program of unification of the german forces a blind obedience to a goal was created to assure our right to live forever and ever by so doing we chose a path between two extremes the one of these extremes was holding our people it was the liberal individualist extreme which made the individual not only the center of interest but also the center of all action on the other hand our people were tempted by the theory of universal humanity which alone was to guide the individual our ideals were between the two we saw the people as a community of body and soul formed and willed by providence we are put into this community and within it alone can we form our existence we have consciously subordinated all considerations to this goal have shaped all interests according to it and all our actions thus the national socialist world of thought arose which has overcome individualism but not by cutting down individual capacities or individual initiative only by asserting that the common interest is superior to individual liberty and the initiative of the individual this common interest regulates and orders if necessary curtails but also commands wow that's deep let's read that all right it says by so doing we chose a path between two extremes the one of these extremes was holding our people one of these extremes was holding our people it was the liberal in the individualist extreme all right which made the individual not only the center of interest but also the center of all action all right on the other hand our people were tempted by the the theory of universal humanitarian humanity humanity all right so universal humanity is living in one melting pot where everyone gives up their nationality and their their religion their ancestors they forget the way they live and just live like one big group of heathens that's what universal humanity is which on which which alone was the god was to guide the individual our idea our ideas were but on um, between the two we saw the people as a community of body and soul form and will by providence all right all right we we are we are put into this community and within it alone can we form our existence we have um consciously supported supported it all considerations to this goal all right have have shaped all interests according to it and all our actions thus the national socialist world all right national socialist world of of thought arose which has overcome individualism all right 
but not by cutting down individual capacity or individual initi initiatives, only by is asserting that the common interest superior to individual li liberty and to in initi in initiative of, of the individual, this common interest regards of order if necessary curtails but also the commands so that's a lot to swallow right there i'll be back commands. commands thus we started a struggle against everyone in those days against the individualist as well as against the humanitarians and in this struggle we slowly conquered the german nation during 14 years the 1,000 members which this movement counted at the end of its first year of life, a number which was to increase steadily these followers were but Germans who had come from other movements. Hundreds of thousands of my SA and SS had been fighters in other organizations, whom we had all convinced and conquered by winning their inner allegiance. That was perhaps the greatest battle of souls in our history. I could not force anybody to go with me, to enter my organization they all had to be inwardly convinced and this conviction caused them to make great sacrifices. This struggle was to be really fought out in the spirit by word, form and writing. Only when an ill-willed opponent said, I cannot defeat you in the spirit, but I am stronger than you, only then did I, the former soldier, rightly answer violence with violence. Before I, apparently one or two words left out by Hitler. The fighting movement which fought by the spirit as long as the opponent kept to spiritual weapons. But I did not hesitate to appeal to violence when the other thought he would help the spirit by violence. Our opponents at that time were those who have always fought us inside as well as outside the country, a conglomeration of people who feel, think and act according to international ideas. We know the coalitions of that time. In this battle of the spirit we have defeated them everywhere. For when at last I was called to power, I came in the legal way, under the presidency of Reich's General Field Marshal von Hindenburg because I was backed by the strongest movement. This means that the so-called National Socialist Revolution has defeated democracy, within democracy, by democracy. We acquired power legally and today, too, I am facing you here on a mandate given to me by the German nation, a mandate more comprehensive than that which any one of the so-called democratic statesmen possess today. When we came to power in 1933 our road was clearly mapped out. It had been defined in a struggle of 15 years, which in a thousand demonstrations had put us under an obligation to the German people. And I would be dishonorable and deserve to be stoned if I had deviated but one step from this program, or if I were to do so now. The social part of this program meant unifying the German people, overcoming all class and race prejudices, educating the German for the community, and if necessary, breaking any opposition to this unity. Economically, it meant building a national German economy which appreciated the importance of private initiative, but subordinated the entire economic life to the common interest. Believe me, here, too, no other aim is thinkable. In times in which the sons are arrayed for defense in battle, and where no difference can be made between those who represent much, and those who represent little, economic advantages or privileged positions to the disadvantage of the total community cannot be maintained. As everywhere, I proceeded here by teaching, educating and slow adaptation, for it was my pride to carry out this revolution without one single windowpane being broken in Germany. A revolution which led to the greatest changes ever achieved on earth, but which destroyed nothing, only slowly reorganized everything, until at last the entire great community had found its new road, that was my goal. It was the same in foreign politics. My program was to do away with Versailles. People all over the world should not pretend to be simpletons and act as if I had only discovered this program in 1933, or 1935, or 1937. These gentlemen should only have read what I wrote about myself a thousand times instead of listening to stupid emigre trash. No human being can have stated and written down as often as I what he wanted, and I wrote it again and again, away with Versailles. And th this was not a whim of ours, but the reason was that Versailles was the greatest injustice and the most abject ill-treatment of a great people ever known in history. Without the abolition of this instrument of force meant to destroy the German people it would have been impossible to keep this people alive. I came forward as a soldier with this program, and spoke about it for the first time in 1919. 
and I have kept to this program as to a solemn obligation during all the years of the struggle for power, and when I came to power I did not say like democratic politicians, follows a quotation from Schiller's fiesco meaning roughly, the monster has carried out his work, now he can be dismissed. But at that moment I said to myself, thank God, for having brought me to a point where I can put my program into action. But again I did not want to do this with violence. I talked as much as any human being can. My speeches in the Reichstag, which cannot be falsified by democratic statesmen, are evidence for history. What offers did I make them? How I begged them to be reasonable. I begged them to see reason and not to interfere with the existence of a great nation. I proved to them that they themselves would derive no benefit from it. I told them it was senseless, and that they would only do themselves harm. What have I not done in all these years to pave the way to an understanding? It would never have been possible to begin this armament race unless others had wanted it. I made proposals to them. However, every proposal, coming as it did from me, was sufficient to cause excitement among a certain Jewish international capitalist clique, just as it used to happen formerly in Germany when every reasonable proposal was rejected only because it was made by national socialists. Wow. So whew, that's a lot. So basically this man said he how I begged them to be reasonable. He begged them. So so this is why, you know, Hitler, you know, people they tell us about him, the media tell us he's a bad man, but we never allow to hear the man words until we dig and read it for ourselves. So let's go over this part right here. It's very important that we understand what he's saying right here. It says, but again, I did not want to do this with violence. So he didn't want violence. I talk as much as any human being can. My speeches in the Reichstag, whatever, I said it wrong, which cannot be falsified by the democratic statements. So they said, he's saying that everything he he wrote it he wrote everything down through transcripts so we can go back and read it for we cannot misconstrue his words so which cannot be falsified by democratic statesmen our our evidence for history so he he left these transcripts for evidence for history what offers this man was brilliant what what offers did i make them how I begged them to be reasonable. So he begged the Englishman to be reasonable. All right, but it's a it, it is a more sinister plot. All right, just like the war in um in Russia and Ukraine, they want to take Russia for an added part of the UN. This is world domination. I begged them to to see reasons and not to interfere check this out with the existence of a great nation all right so they just want to be left alone and keep their their you know their race intact and their culture and they just he's just looking out for his people as a, a leader should i proved to them that they themselves would derive no benefit from it i told them it was senseless so he actually spoke to these people all right he had a conversation with them. He told them that it was senseless and that they would only do, do themselves harm, all right? What have I not done in all these years? So he, he, he been contacting and trying to communicate for years, all right? To pave the way to an understanding. So for years, he was trying to pave a way to an understanding. It would never have been possible to begin this armament race unless others have wanted it. So the, arm, the, the armament race was because the England, America wanted it. I made proposals to them. However, every proposal coming as it did, as it did from me was sufficient to cause excitement among a certain Jewish international capitalistic clique or gang. All right, let's read that again. Was sufficient to cause excitement among a certain Jewish international 
capitalist click. I want you to um drop some names. All right. All right. So just as it used to happen formally in Germany, when every reasonable proposal was rejected only because it was made by national socialists. So they did it. You know that th this thing goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. All right. So let's go ahead and continue. I'll be back with more commentary. Socialists. My Reichstag speech on May 17, 1933, or for that matter, my later speeches, my innumerable announcements at public meetings, all the memoranda which I wrote in these days they were all governed by the one idea, whatever happened it must be possible to find a method for a peaceful revision of this Versailles Treaty. That this treaty was an infamous document, all its authors finally admitted. In fact, the possibility of a revision was to be left open. Only they made the League of Nations the agent for this purpose, and this institution was quite unsuited for its task. The League of Nations was established on the one hand to prevent a revision of the treaty, and, on the other hand, was to have jurisdiction for such a revision. Wow. So we're going to go into history on that. Not today, but we're going to go into the history on that. All right. So it says my Reichstag speech on 17th of May, 1933, or for that matter, my late, later speech, my numerous announcements at public meetings, all the memoranda which I, which I wrote in these days, they were all governed by the once one idea however happen whatever happened it must be possible to find a method for a peaceful revision so he was looking for a peaceful revision of the Versailles Treaty all right that this all right that this treaty was an infamous document all right it goes back to like the 1300s all right now, I think it go back to I gotta look that up. I have it here. All right. All its authors finally admitted, in fact, the possible possibility of a revision. So he was looking for a revision. All right, was to be left open. Only they made the lead of nations um agent for that purpose. And this institute was quite unsuited for its task. The um, leader nation was established on one on the one hand to prevent the revision of the treaty. So they came up with the League of Nations to prevent the revision of the treaty, and on the other hand, was was to have um, jurisdiction for such a revision. So let's see. I think I have it right here. All right. So the Treaty of Versailles. So let's check that out. All right. We're not going to go through this whole thing. We just want to see. Look, the article about the Treaty of Versailles was of 28th of June 1919 at the end of World War One. All right. It was signed on the 28th, 29th, the 28th of June 1919 in the place of Versailles. Exactly five years after the assassination of Archduke Fran Fernandez. Now, when this happened, this is how World War II started because of this one man. He was the reason for World War II. Archduke Fran Fernandez of Austria, which is a part of Germany, heir presumptive to also Hungarian throne okay and his wife Sophie Duchess of Hollenburg Hogenburg Hogenburg were now that's a Jewish name right there and you remember the Khazars they um, occupy Ukraine so <laughs> I'm pretty sure this has something to do with that were assassinated so both of them was assassinated okay um, on the 28th of 1914 by um, Bosnian Serb students. So a student did it. They were shot at close range while being driven. All right. 
so all right so which led the war so he led the war the archbishop that's why they shot him <laughs> at the central power of germany signed a sign um all right central powers of Ger of the german side signed exactly a um, separate treaties all right so let's go to here the League of Nations I'm just giving like a little quick history of that the League of Nations was a was the first worldwide intergovernmental organization so this is the first world that's where they get the League of Nations from um, Batman and the old Superman cartoons these people were wicked man intergovernment organizations who's who print who who principal mission was to maintain world peace that's a damn lie that's a damn lie it was founded look january 1920 by paris peace conference that ended the first world war all right the paris peace conference was a formal meeting in 1919 and 1920 of various allies after the end of world war one to set the peace terms of the defeated central powers dominated by the the leaders of britain france united states and italy all right the edomites all right let's go back to the article man all right so i'll be back with more comment uh, <laughs> Revision At first we were not members of the League, and later German participation amounted in the last analysis to nothing but the payments of yearly installments. That was the only positive thing as far as Germany could see. Of course, Germany was then a democracy and the Democrats of Berlin begged, on their knees. They went to Geneva before the International Tribunal. They begged, give us a revision. Everything was in vain. All right, so let me see if I have something for the Geneva. I think I have it here. I just like to share the, the, there you go right here. All right, so the Disarmament Conference Geneva in 1933. Do you see any black people here? So-called black people? These are the faces of the elites who run the world, who colonize everything, who control everything these are the people that Hitler another white man had beef with all right you see that these people are something else man all right so let's go down here we're gonna do read this summary real quick and we'll be back to um, the book 60 countries sent delegations to the disarmament conference that um, co co convened in Geneva in February 1932 to consider um, reduction of an armament. <laughs> so they wanted to get rid of their weapons with particular emphasis on offensive weapons. Germany, see, basically they, they come together to try to get you to get rid of your weapons before they could kill you. Whose army and Navy already were limited by Treaty of Versailles demanded that other states disarm to Germany level and in in the event they refused to do so claim a right to build up its armed forces France which feared the rival of Germany power argued that security must proceed this armament and ca and call for security guarantee and the establishment st establishment of an international police force before it would reduce its own forces deadlock the conference adjourned in summer of 1932 in convinced in it 
convinced in February 1933, only days after Adolf Hitler had assumed power of, in Germany, determined to rearm. <laughs> all right, Germany rejected all proposals. Did not accord. Did not accord it immediate military um, party with a Western power. All right. So basically, that's just a little summary. We're gonna get back to the book, but it won't take up so much time. And I'll be back with with more um, of my my view. All right. So I'll be back. Vain. I, as the National Socialist, recognized after a few months that this tribunal would not help us. Accordingly, I did what I could, but I say our adversaries always confused us with the people with whom they had dealt since November 1918. The German nation had nothing in common with those men. That was not Germany. They were miserable individuals kept by England and France, who had doped them. That was not the German nation, and to connect the nation with such people we regard as a defamation. If the others believed they could apply the same methods to us they applied to the November men, they were greatly mistaken. In that event both sides were at cross purposes. They could not expect us to go to Geneva and continue begging, to receive kicks, and to beg again. If they expected that, they mistook the former German soldier for the traitor of 1918. Of course, those November men could not do anything but give in, for they were in fetters, they were caught in the fetters of that other world. We, however, have no reason to give in to that other world, or do the English perhaps believe that we have an inferiority complex when we compare ourselves with them? Several words drowned in applause. Then they forced us down by a lie, a trick, but the British soldiers did not defeat us. Neither did it seem during the Western campaign that any change has taken place. I, myself, and in fact, all of us, made up our minds that voluntary negotiation at Geneva would not yield any result. The only thing to do, therefore, was to leave Geneva. Never in my life have I pushed myself. Those who do not want to talk to me need not do so. Now here are 85 million Germans looking into the future with pride and confidence. They are heirs of a great history. We had a world empire when England was nothing but a small island, and for a longer time than for 300 years. Indeed, they forced us to take the road which we took. The League of Nations only ridiculed and derided us. We left it. At the disarmament conference, the same happened, and we left it. We started on the road which we were forced to choose, but all the time we strove for understanding and conciliation. In this connection I may point out that our striving in one case, in that of France, almost succeeded. When the Saar plebiscite took place and the Saar territory was returned to the Reich, I made up my mind, with difficulty, and declared on behalf of the German nation that I would waive any further revision in the West. The French accepted this as a matter of course, but I told the French ambassador of the day, look here, this is by no means a matter of course as you seem to imagine. What we are doing is making a sacrifice in the interest of peace. We make this sacrifice, but we, at least, want to have peace in exchange for it. But the ruthlessness of the capitalist plutocrats in these countries always broke through in a short time, fostered by emigrants who presented a picture of the German situation which was naturally quite mad, but was believed, because it seemed agreeable and then, of course, it was propagated by Jewish hatred. This collection of capitalist interests on the one hand, Jewish instincts of hatred and the emigrants' lust for revenge, succeeded in increasingly beclouding the world, enveloping it in phrases, and in inciting it against the present German Reich, just as against the Reich which preceded us. At that time they opposed the Germany of the Kaiser, this time, they opposed National Socialist Germany. In fact, they opposed any Germany which might be in existence. But my decision was firm, in no circumstances, to abandon one's rights, for in doing so it would not be theories which were given up, but the lives of millions of the future. I do not sacrifice some point or other in a party program, for in such a case one sacrifices the future, a race, and nobody is entitled to do that unless he stands before the people and says, I can no longer represent your interests, someone else must take over. But we did not come to power having on our program we are ready to abandon the interests of the German nation. I came with the oath, I abandon no interests. 
For, my country, it was not as if the abandoning of interests would bring quiet for all time. All right, so I do want to touch on one thing. Um, at this part right here, where it says, but the ruthless, the ruthlessness of capitalists, um, um, plutocrat, plural, plutocrats in these countries were, were broke, countries always broke through in a short time, fostering by immigrants who presented a picture of German situ situations which was naturally quite mad but was believed because it seems agreeable and and then of course it was it was propagated by jewish hatred all right so let's look at the plural cracks and we're gonna see what that is because we have to understand what's going on here look it says don't call them reformers call them plutocratic profaneers I would suggest the term reformer be replaced by the term plurocratic profaneers reform think tanks I know we use we hit we used to hear this kind of um, jargon because they use it a lot especially those underwriting other written by hedge funders tend to promote ideas based on the premise that the market is pure and anything that interferes with the marketplace is a problem all right <laughs> so let's see at images and see what comes up all right you already know who these people are the monopoly Look at the stuff that come up. We know who these people are. They still the same people today. The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds. Yeah, the people who own Hollywood. Look at this, man. Yeah. So we already know who made the, the, the game Monopoly. And who who that guy with the um <laughs> the little glass on his eye? I forgot what you call that. Man, it's crazy. So we're gonna go ahead and continue. And um we're about you know 20, 30 minutes away from the, the finish line. So thank you for if you tune around, thank you. Let's continue. Time. We saw that from the old German Reich which began with abandoning the western provinces of the Reich, and went on and on, and every decade demanded further sacrifices, until finally, Germany was broken in pieces then the century-long powerlessness came over the people. As against that, I am determined not to give way one step. Therefore when I saw that the old warmongers of the Great War were resuming their criminal activities in England, when Messrs Churchill, Eden, Duff Cooper, and Horbalicia and so on, and Van Sittert, our great old friend, and then Chamberlain and Halifax when these old men again began their warmongering then it was clear to me that these people were not concerned with reaching a just understanding with Germany, but that they believed they could again break Germany down, cheaply, and the quicker. Alright, so check this out. Look at this. You know, we live in an age of what? Warmongering. <laughs> so check this out. Let's see how he phrased that. He says, our great old friend and then Chamberlain and Halif and Halifax when these old men again began their warmongering, then it was clear to me that these people were not concerned with reaching a just understanding with Germany, but that they believed they could again break Germany down cheaply and the quicker, the easy, the easier. Wow. We live in a sinister world, man. Sinister, sinister world. quicker the easier. You know what happened then, my countrymen. In those years, beginning in 1934, I armed. 
When in the Reichstag in September 1939, I outlined the extent of German armament, the rest of the world did not believe, for those who live by bluff think that others are only bluffing. But we have already experienced that internally. Here, too, my opponents never believed me. When it is said that the prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, I should like to extend it, and say that his prophecies are not esteemed. So it always was with me. And now it goes beyond our own country, we are having exactly the same experience as my National Socialist co-fighters had at home. Every one of our prophecies was laughed at, every statement was represented as ridiculous, every picture of the future described as a fantastic chimera. We were greeted only with mockery and laughter. Now I can only say to this world, but I have armed and very much so. The German people know it today. But it does not know nearly all. But it is not at all necessary that everything should be told. What is decisive is that everything has been done. We have demanded nothing from the others. When France entered this war, she had absolutely no reason. It was merely the desire to fight against Germany again. They said, we want the Rhineland, naturally we now want to split up Germany, we want to tear away the Ostmark, we want to disintegrate Germany. They actually wallowed in fantasies of the destruction of our Reich, which were completely unreal in the 20th century, the century of the conception of nationality. It was simply childish. Wow. So now that we hear this man's words, look what he just said. He says, we have demanded nothing from the others, right? He said, when France entered this war, she had absolutely no reason. It was merely the desire to fight against Germany again. They said, we want the, the Rhineland. Naturally, we now want to split up Germany. So they basically, this man just fighting to preserve his culture, his people, his land, his way of life. We want to tear down the Osmark and, and we, we want to disintegrate Germany. They actually wallow in fantasies of the destruction of our Reich, which were completely unreal in the 20th century, the century of the conception of nationality. It was simply childish. And that, that's his words. And I'll be back. childish and england i held out my hand again and again it was actually my program to reach an understanding with the english people we had really no point of difference absolutely none there was a solitary point the return of the german colonies and on that i said we will negotiate that sometime i do not fix any time Okay, let's read that what he just said. It says, in England, I held out my hand again and again, meaning he wanted to be friends. He wanted to come back because the Germans and the Englishman are the same people. They are cousins. All right. It's like black Americans fighting against Jamaicans or Haitians. We are the same people. All right. So they're the same people. All right. So I held out my hand again and again. It was actually my program to reach an understanding with the Eng English people. So it was his, that, that was what he wanted to do. He wanted to reach an understanding with the English people. We had really no point of difference. difference. So they're the same people. Absolutely none. There was a solidary point. All right. All right. Solidary me, a separation point. To the return, the return of the German colonies and on this I said I will negotiate that sometime I do not fix any time all right so let's go ahead and continue and this is gonna um, end real good so pay attention time for England those colonies are useless. They cover 40 million square meters. What do they do with them? Absolutely nothing. 
That is only the avarice of old usurers, who possess something and will not give it up, perverted beings who see their neighbor has nothing to eat, while they themselves cannot use what they possess. The mere thought of giving away something makes them ill. Moreover, I have demanded nothing which belonged to the English, I have demanded only what they robbed and stole in the years 1918 and 1909. In fact, robbed and stole against the solemn assurance of the American president. We have not asked them for anything, not demanded anything, again and again I offered my hand for negotiations. Wow. Look, he says, I have demanding nothing. All right, let's start. I'm going to start right here. All right, that 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 is that is only a verse of old usury. All right. Okay, who possesses something and will and will not give it up, all right? Perverted being of being of who who see their neighbors has nothing to eat all right meaning the englishman while they themselves cannot use what they possess all right over colonization the mere thought of giving away anything makes them ill meaning the englishman and the so-called you wish man all right moreover i have demanding nothing which belong to the english i have demanded only what they robbed and stole in the the year 1918 and 1990 so all he wanted back was the land that belonged to germany in fact robbed and stole again the solemn insurance robbed and stole against the solemn insurance of the american president so america has bloody hands we have not asked them for anything not demand anything again and again i offer my hand for a negotiation so he was trying to plead with these people hey we brothers <laughs> it's a hey, it's a dirty game i'm going to continue and i'll be back we almost at the end now negotiations ever more clearly it became apparent that it is german unification itself this very state which they hate irrespective of its aspect no matter whether imperial or national socialist, whether democratic or authoritarian. Most of all they hate the social progress of the Reich, and here, clearly, external hatred has combined with the meanest internal egotism. For they say, never shall we be reconciled with this world it is the world of awakening social conscience. End of sentence drown in applause. As far as this goes, I can only tell the gentlemen on both shores of the Atlantic, in the present war that side will achieve victory in the end were the social conscience. Several inaudible words. They can wage wars for their capitalist interests, but in the end these wars will open the way for social risings within the nations, for in the long run it is impossible that hundreds of millions of human beings should be aligned according to the interests of a few individuals. In the long run the greater interest of mankind is bound to prevail over the interests of these little plutocratic profiteers. Okay, I do want to go over this part right here. He said they can rage war with with their capitalist capitalist interests, but in the end these wars will will open the way of social rising. So the people going to rise up within the nations. All right. For in the long run, it is impossible that hundred, that hundreds of millions of people, be, 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 um, being, beings should be aligned according to the interests of a few individuals. In the long run, the greater interest of mankind is bound to prevail over the interests of these plutocratic profiteers. All right, so let's look at that again. The plutocratic profiteers, and look who, look what that means again. All right, all right. I would suggest, I I would suggest the term reformer be replaced with plutocratic profiteers, reform think tanks, especially those underwritten by hedge funds tend to promote ideas based on the premise 
that the marketplace is pure and anything that interferes with the marketplace is a problem. All right. A plutocracy is a type of political system dominated by wealthy and exam an example of the plutocracy in look is ancient Rome during its Republic period from 509 BC to 27 BC and the Gallic age in the United States from 1876 to 19 wow 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 all right let's continue we almost finished and um, I really enjoyed this study here man it was really you know insightful so let's continue profiteers proof that in other countries too a crisis is already beginning to develop in this sphere is that english labor leaders now suddenly come out with new social conceptions so worn out and antiquated that i can only say put them back into the chest we have already divested ourselves of this sort of material it is out of date if you want to know how these things are being done, then you must not take up programs which in our country would have been modern in the 80s or 90s. You must come to us and study here, then you will learn something, gentlemen. But the mere fact that anything like that is suddenly put forward as an aim for what then are these gentlemen actually waging war? First, they said it was to fight against national socialism that the nations of the world had to be bled white, and now, suddenly they detect in their bottom drawers, points that were in the programs of our predecessors. Why all this? They could have had all this cheaper. But this fact furnishes proof that there, too, the nations are showing signs of action, or if for instance a storm breaks out in England, because somebody a colonel or a general, I believe declares that in the England of such an advanced social standard, they cannot use officers taken from the lower section of the population, but only officers from the upper classes the others are unfit then I can only say, do you get exasperated because he has said this? You should not get exasperated because this is not the case, but not for the reason that somebody has at long last expressed it. It is interesting that no one gets exasperated over the fact that the reality is like this, that is to say, that in point of fact only representatives of the upper classes can attain a position there. This is what should exasperate you, and not the fact that by mere chance someone was, while this war is on, unwise enough to make that statement. In our country, if you are interested to hear it, this was remedied long ago. Only a short time ago you pointed out to us that our officers and generals were incapable, because they are all too young and infested with national socialist ideas. Meanwhile developments have shown which side has the better generals. If the war continues this will prove a great misfortune for England, and you will have ample opportunity to gain further experience. The English will make up their minds to send a commission which is to take over our soldiers. It is this social Germany which is hated most by this clique, a conglomeration of Jews, their financiers and profiteers. Our Hold up. We got to read that. All right, so we're going to go from here. Okay, only in a short time ago, you pointed out to us that our officers and generals were incapable because they are all too young and infested with social, national socialist ideas. Meanwhile, the de developments have shown which side have the better generals. If the war continues, this will prove a great misfortune, misfortune of for England, and will and you will have ample opportunity to gain further experience. The the English will make up its mind to sink a commission which is to take over our soldiers it is it is this um social Ger germany which is hated most by this clique all right which this gang the conglomeration of you wish all right their finance their financiers and profiteer clicks all right that's <laughs> all right so they plutocratics all right look profit all right 
Yeah, feel me? All right. So this this statement, the plurocratic profaneers, we already know who they is. All right. So let's continue. Our foreign policy. That's what we at. Let's continue. Our foreign policy, our policy in the interior, and our economic policy have been clearly defined. We have set ourselves only one aim, the people. All paths upon which we set our feet will lead to this purpose. Furthermore, we recognize that unless one wants to destroy everything, one must start and proceed on this path with many compromises and many leniencies. But the movement is not the temporary appearance of one man. Many years ago, in Mein Kampf I said that National Socialism will put its stamp on the next thousand years of Germany history. You cannot conceive it without National Socialism. It will only then disappear when its program has become a matter of course. But not before that time. But even in war, the possibility of an understanding still existed. At once, after the war with Poland, I held out my hand. I did not ask it. Zones via Holland and Belgium collapsed after a few days. France went the same way. England was chased. E. But even in war, the possibility of an understanding still existed. At once, after the war with Poland, I held out my hand. I did not ask anything from either France or England. It was in vain. After the collapse in the West, I again held out my hand to England. I was received with derision. They practically spat at me. They were indignant. All right. Everything is in vain. The financial interests of this democracy are victorious over the true national interests. Once more, the nation's blood must be at the service of the money of this small group of interested people. Thus the war started and thus it will go on. But, looking back, I may point out one thing, the year behind us and the last part of the previous year have practically decided this war. The opponent which they first mobilized against us in the East was overthrown in a few weeks. The attempt to cut us off from Norway in the iron ore bases, and to gain a base for attack against Northeast Germany was dealt with in the same way, within a few weeks. The attempt to reach the border of the Ruhr and the Ruhr zones via Holland and Belgium collapsed after a few days. France went the same way. England was chased from the continent. I sometimes read now of a British intention to begin a great offensive somewhere. I have only one wish, that they should inform me of it in advance, that I would have this European territory cleared beforehand. I should like to save them the difficulties of landing and we should then introduce ourselves and discuss matters once more. And in the language which is the only one they understand they now have hopes. For they must have hopes. What are they expecting now? We are now standing on this continent and from where we stand nobody will be able to remove us again. We have created certain bases, and when the time comes we shall deal the decisive blows, and that we have made good use of our time will be historically impressed on the gentlemen during this year. What are, are they waiting for? For the help of others? I can only say one thing, we have from the beginning allowed for any eventuality. That the German nation has no quarrel with the Americans is evident to everybody who does not consciously wish to falsify truth. At no time has Germany had interests on the American continent except perhaps that she helped that continent in its struggle for liberty. If states on this continent now attempt to interfere in the European conflict, then the aim will only be changed more quickly. Europe will then defend herself. And do not let people deceive themselves. Those who believe they can help England must take note of one thing, every ship, whether with or without convoy which appears before our torpedo tubes is going to be torpedoed. We are involved in a war which we did not want. Otherwise one could not stretch out one's hand to the other side. However, if those financial hyenas want war, if they want to exterminate Germany, they will get the surprise of their lives. This time they are not up against a weakened Germany, as they were during the World War. This time, they have joined battle with a Germany which is mobilized to the limit of her power, able and resolved to fight. However, should the other side entertain hopes to the contrary, then I can only say, I cannot understand you.
All right, so this is this is wow, wow, wow. So I'm gonna go back up here, and um, it says that the German nation has no quarrel, no beef with Amer the Americans. It is evident to everybody who, because you gotta remember that the word the English language is a, a derision or a, a, it's it's Germanish. It's like a German language. All right, so the German nation has no quarrel with the Americans. It is evident to everybody who do, who does not unconsciously wish to falsify truth. At no time has Germany had any interest of, um, on the American continent, except perhaps that she helped the continent in its struggle for liberty. Now we're gonna drop down here. It says we are involved in war which we did not want. So Hitler said he didn't want this war. Otherwise, one could not scratch out one's hand to the other side. However, if those, if, well check this out, he said, if those finan financial hyenas want war, and you know, gotta remember, America is controlled by the you wish elites who run the banks, all right? Um, if they want to exterminate Germany, they will get the surprise of their lives. This time, they are not going up against the weakened Germany. All right. So I'm going to continue and we're going to try to close this out. You. They speak of Italy's coming defection. Let those gentlemen not invent revolution in Milan, let them rather see that unrest does not break out in their own countries. Those countries view the relationship between Germany and Italy as they do their own. If in democracies one gives aid to the other, he asks a quid pro quo basis or something of the sort. These he then owns. When, therefore, the Italians sent aircraft formations to the Atlantic coast the English newspapers wrote that the Italians were putting there or in the conduct of the war, and that they would in future demand an Atlantic base by way of compensation. On the other hand, now that German aircraft formations are in Sicily, they say that presumably Germany will confiscate that island. These gentlemen can be quite certain that no German or Italian is moved by such fine stories. Such tales show only the pathetic lack of spirit of those people who in England retail such anecdotes. We can deduce from those writings that the people over there have not yet understood the meaning of the present war, but we have understood it very well. Wherever we can meet England we will meet her. However, if they regard the present setbacks of our partner as evidence of their victory, then I really cannot understand Englishmen. Whenever they have setbacks of their own they regard them as big victories. The gentleman over there may be convinced our calculation is quite accurate, and the reckoning will be made after the war, foot by foot, square kilometer by square kilometer. Another thing these people must understand, the Duce and myself are not Jews nor out for bargains. If we shake hands, that is the handshake of men of honor. I hope that in the course of the year, the gentleman will acquire a more accurate understanding of this. Perhaps they pin their hopes on the Balkans. If I were they, I would not give much for that. One thing is certain. Whenever England puts in an appearance we shall attack her, and we are sufficiently strong to do so. Perhaps they pin their hopes on other countries which they can involve in this war. I don't know. But my party comrades, men and women, you have known me for so many years as a careful man with foresight, I can assure you that every possible contingency has been weighed and calculated. We shall win final victory. Perhaps, though probably not to the same extent, they expect famine. We have organized our lives. We know at the beginning that there would not be too much of anything in wartime. However, the German nation will never starve, never, rather will the English nation, those gentlemen can be sure of that. Raw material shortage. That too, we have foreseen, and have for that reason made our four years plan. Maybe this has already dawned on some Englishmen. There might be one other point. Perhaps they really believe that once again they will be able to dope the German nation with their lies, their propaganda, and their empty words. To this I can only say that they should not have slept for so long. It would be better for them to look into the development of the German nation somewhat more carefully. 
In the same way, they were idiotic enough to try to estrange the Italian nation and the Duce. One British lord rises and appeals to the Italian nation no longer to follow the Duce, but his lordship. That is too idiotic. Such an ass, next words, drowned. Then another lord rises and admonishes the German nation to follow his lordship, and to turn away from me. I can only tell these people, others in Germany have tried that game. Those people have no conception of the German nation, of the National Socialist State, of our community, the army of our marching masses, of our people. Those people have no conception of our propaganda. Perhaps, because they themselves were not quite convinced of the effectiveness of their ideas, which they borrowed from some people in Germany. However, these people are those who so miserably failed here, the emigrants who had to leave. Such are their advisors, and we can see it by the pamphlets. We know for certain that this one was written by this fellow, that one by that fellow. Just as idiotic as, following drowned, in the time of the system. Only at that time this stuff was labeled Vossisch Zeitung and is now labeled Times or something, and those people imagined that these old, old stories, which were a failure in the Vossisch Zeitung will now be successful because they are published by the Times or the Daily Telegraph. A real softening of the brain has broken out in these democracies. They can rest assured, the German people will do everything necessary for its interest. It will follow its leadership. It knows that its leadership has no other goal. It knows that today the man at the head of the Reich is not one with a packet of shares in his pocket and with ulterior motives. This German people, I know it and I am proud of it, is pledged to me and will go with me through thick and thin. An ancient spirit has come to life again in this people a spirit which was with us once before, a fanatic readiness to accept any burden. We will repay every blow with compound interest. The blow will only harden us, and whatever they mobilize against us, and if the world were full of devils, we will succeed all the same, quote from Luther's hymn, a mighty fortress is our God. But when they end up by saying, but think of all the mistakes they made. God, who doesn't make mistakes? This morning I read that an Englishman, I don't know how, has calculated that I made seven mistakes last year. The man is mistaken. I have checked it. I did not make seven mistakes, but 724. But I continued to calculate and found that my opponents had made 4,385,000. That is right. I have checked it carefully. We will manage to get on in spite of our mistakes. We will make as many mistakes this year as last year, and if I make as many mistakes as in 1940, then I must thank God on my knees at the end of the year for letting me make only seven mistakes. And if the enemies do as many clever things as last year, I shall be satisfied. We go into the new year with a fighting force armed as never before in our German history. The number of our divisions on land has been enormously increased. Pay has been increased, the gigantic unique experience of war among the leaders and the file has been put to use. The equipment has been improved our enemies will see how it has been improved, applause and commotion. In the spring our U-boat war will begin at sea, and they will notice that we have not been sleeping, shouts and cheers. And the Air Force will play its part and the entire armed forces will force the decision by hook or by crook. Our production has increased enormously in all spheres. What others are planning we have achieved. The German people follows its leadership with determination, confident in its armed forces and ready to bear what fate demands. The year 1941 will be, I am convinced, the historical year of a great European new order. The program could not be anything else than the opening up of the world for all, the breaking down of individual privileges, the breaking of the tyranny of certain peoples, and better still, of their financial autocrats. Finally this year will help to assure the basis for understanding between the peoples, and thereby, for their reconciliation. I do not want to miss pointing out what I pointed out on 3rd of September, 1940, in the German Reichstag, that if jury were to plunge the world into war, the role of jury would be finished in Europe. They may laugh about it today, as they laughed before about my prophecies. The coming months and years will prove that I prophesied rightly in this case too. But we can see already how our racial peoples which are today still hostile to us will one day recognize the greater inner enemy, and that they too will then enter with us into a great common front. The front of Aryan mankind against Jewish international exploitation and destruction of nations. The 
year which lies behind us has been a year of great successes, but also, it is true, one of many sacrifices. Even if the total number of dead and wounded is small in comparison with former wars the sacrifices for each individual family concerned weigh heavy. Our whole sympathy, our love and care belongs to those who had to make these sacrifices. They have suffered what generations before us also had to suffer. Each individual German had to make other sacrifices. The nation worked in all spheres. German women worked to replace men. It is a wonderful idea of community which dominates our people. That this ideal, that our whole strength should be preserved in the coming year this should be our wish today. That we will work for this community let that be our vow. That we conquer in devotion to this community that is our faith, one in which we are confident, and that the Lord should not abandon us in this struggle of the coming year let that be our prayer. Deutschland. Sieg Heil. As recorded by the Monitoring Service of the British Broadcasting Corporation, courtesy of the Research Project for Totalitarian Communication, New School for Social Research. All right, so like it says, as recorded by the Monitoring Service of the British Broadcast Broadcasting Corporation. So this is in the public domain. So there's no reason for YouTube to try to block my video. I just spent like a, two hours making it. All right. Courtesy of Research Project or the Tutorian Tutorian tutor, tutor, Communications New School for Social Research. So basically, this is for social research. Okay. Now, my take based on, um, you know, uh, how I sum everything up, this guy really loved his people. He was trying to protect his land and he pointed out the same things, issues we have with our oppressors in America. He had the same issues with them also. The same issues I had with the Englishman and the people who stole our identity because black Americans, we are the real Jews from the tribe of Judah based on the Bible and it's not being racist. We just know who we are as a people. And um, I really appreciate this study, um, you know, being able to find it here. And um, I do thank you for watching Word on the Street where we bring you hot topics, um, books, Bible teachings, history, what's going on in our community. With that in mind, thank you for watching Word on the Street and peace.